Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Lu Ted. I'm a professor at the Department of Communication and Journalism, mm -hmm. and I'm the director of the Data Test Lab associated with the uh, Institute okay. of Data Science, who kindly sponsored uh, today's research seminar. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Caroline Ling. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Connecticut. She, her research integrates specific multimedia narratives with digital informatics and data science tools to achieve effective communication outcome. Throughout her work studying the effect of human computer interaction, she has developed a medical informatics system, two house video games, and two mobile apps, all focused on health risk management, our healthy living education, as well as storm risk preparedness, mitigation, and recovery. I also want to say that uh, Dr. Ling is a fellow of the International Communication Association, uh, which is like the highest award that people in my field can get. Uh, she is also the founder of the Communication Technology Division for uh, Association of Journal Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. She also ranked among top two percent most cited scientists in the world. So it gives me great pleasure to have to introduce you to you, Dr. Ling. Uh, Can you hear me in the back? My yes. classroom voice. Huh? So I don't speak Texas, but I could say howdy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. It's an honor to be here. I have known Aki forever, but I'm finally here to visit Aki. Um, you're very famous. You probably know that, right? And I finally met, I didn't meet you at Nazca in person, but I heard that in the Nazca walking to here, you had to cancel class. Uh, the mascot falls asleep. Oh, falls asleep. Oh. You know, we did have a decision at the University of Connecticut as well because we also have a mascot. It's a husband. You'll meet husband later. Okay. So for today's uh, seminar or lecture, whatever it is, I want to introduce you. You know, I was think, thinking I pulled three different topics together at the last minute, thinking I could do them do them all. So anyway, I will try because we're talking about risk communication, informatic tools, and environmental literacy, health and equity. So it's a lot of subject under the same umbrella. So I will do my best and, and somehow you disagree with me, please raise your hand. It will be totally, totally okay. okay. All right. All right. So I think you're from Texas, you're near Houston. You're familiar with this picture, right? That's actually Houston in 2021. Uh, it is Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Harvey. So risk communication, I think just by implication, it is talking about communicating about risk. The risks, we have all kinds of risks in our lives, right? But the risks that threaten us mostly on a daily basis would be health risk, that would be one, and environmental risk. You live in Texas, you're, you're not on Houston, so you're not as threatened by some of the hurricanes. And you're also not in the flash of uh, flat alley, you're not. You, you don't have San Antonio rivers running across your campus here. So in terms of environmental risk management, Oh, there's a, um, the importance of risk communication is clear, but its execution does not often apply strategic communication techniques. I'll explain what that means in a, in a, in a bit. Risk management communication typically involves a top-down one-way advisory or warning, which gets repeated with continuing updates. So let's say a hurricane is coming. We hope that's not the case. That's pretty much what you get. I can keep hearing official advisories and so on and so forth. After a while, people kind of, you ignore it after a while, some of you do. Exactly. Because it's very top down. It's just like broadcasting. What does it really mean? They don't always explain that. So one way communication of crucial information may create risk awareness or you're aware that the hurricane is coming, but it may not translate risk awareness into 
population actions, which is probably true to most of you. I live in Connecticut. We also get hurricanes, but not as often as you do. Risk communication that utilizes strategic tactics can share useful resources by making them accessible to the public and then hopefully motivate people to take protective actions. So some of you are communication majors, am I correct? What is strategic communication? Anyone? Think of the word strategic, right? Okay, so public relations would be one. Advertising, marketing, political communication, any communication that has a very specific goals and utilize not only information dissemination techniques, but ideally the, the best information dissemination techniques, meaning knowing which channels to go to. To reach you guys, Instagram would be great, right? Or even maybe TikTok. So that's channel dissemination. And the other one is messaging. So when you message, ideally, you don't just announce something. You make people really understand that message is actually relevant to me. So that would be persuasion to an extent, right? So let's go on to the next slide. So as you can see, the shaded area around the United States, including over here, also in the Pacific, those are the areas that are affected by climate change a lot when it comes to sea level rise, for example, hurricanes and severe weather patterns. So weather disasters and risk communication failures could, actually, could happen in these areas and coastal communities along the Atlantic Ocean and Mexican Gulf from Maine all the way through Texas face severe coastal storms and hurricanes annually. So when risk communication fail or failures, in effectively informing and convincing the public of the severe weather events. For example, associated with Hurricane Katrina. Um, you're a little young, so you probably distant memory, right? And Hurricane Katrina, I, I think you, that was a long time ago. Um, your parents will remember. It, it's the biggest hurricane in modern history. And just look at the cause of it. The economic cost was estimated at $125 billion, not to mention over 2,000 lives that were lost in one hurricane. So that's a huge event if you think about it. And lots of studies being published about Hurricane uh, Katrina. And one thing that people all found to be true was complete communication failure. So here is an example of. Um, I don't know whether you recognize that, that's Long Island Sound up north. And the shoreline there, that would be the state of Connecticut. And that little peninsula is actually Long Island, which is connected to the state of New York City. Okay. So you can see all the dots. All those dots indicate vulnerable areas when the sea level rise can also hurricanes and severe storms. So here on the lower right is a town called Fairfield, Connecticut. It's a very affluent community. During Hurricane Sandy in 2012, at that point out there, they had 12 feet storm surge. How tall is the ceiling here? I would say maybe 12 feet, not quite 14. So just think about the water that goes up much higher than your height. And the water storm surge actually went six miles inland and almost overcome the 200 some years old town hall. You know, New England is old England, but in New America, right? So some of the landmarks are really old and people really want to protect them. That's very severe storm if you think about it. So Hurricane Sandy was a bit, the biggest severe biggest storm ever in Connecticut history. And you can see all the vulnerable areas right here. So then I'm just gonna quickly show you, I know there's a lot of arrows and so on. This is one of my publications where I was funded to study Hurricane Sandy 
and I actually, Fairfield, town of Fairfield is one of the cities that I study. And in this case, what I want to draw your attention to would be looking on the left side, with look, looking at information dissemination channels. I actually study offline, offline news sources, and I don't know your media use patterns a little bit different from, let's say, that of your grandparents, right? Are your grandparents still listening to the radio? Do they? they still watch TV? So that's still really important to them. Okay. So you can see that actually it did predict vulnerability perception for some people because this is a general population sample, online news source, but it did not trigger necessarily information seeking. But online sources such as the internet, social media, all the rest, did trigger information seeking about the hurricane and weather and alert app. Some of, how many of you have a weather app on your on your phone? Most, pretty much everybody does, right? Okay, so those seem to work. And if you look at the variables in the middle, vulnerable, vulnerability perceptions, and that is when you encounter a threat, which is a risk, you think you're vulnerable to the risk. That's what it means. But assuming that you think that, yes, I am at risk, but how serious is the risk is the second thing that you probably ask yourself, right? And that would be severity perception. You need both to make people feel like, gee, I am under threat, I need to do something. So that then it will make you think about, am I able to, do I have the resources myself to help myself protect my home, protect my family? Let's assume we're talking about your parents, right? And am I able to make sure that my roof does not get blown away? Am I, am I worried that the tree is going to fall? to my house to think about when it's a storm you think about these things around here i don't think you hit huge flooding problem necessarily but if you live in houston that's a different story right so and then all right so first of all you think about whether i am able to protect my family the second thing is okay i may not be able to protect my family very well because I lack certain resources. What about the resources that are out there that I could utilize to help myself? So for example, neighbors will be a resource. That's one example. And also local emergency shelters could help you and local uh, local first responders. And during a big disaster, your local government would typically set up a center to help people, including Red Cross and different volunteers. So. Let's say the storm hit. Yeah, no electricity, right? Okay. You want so those are the, what we call the resources that could help you. After the storm, for example, if your house is damaged, then federal emergency FEMA management agency, FEMA. You heard of FEMA before? Uh, they are a huge resource to come in to help you assess your damage and actually give you some spending money to buy food and your insurance company if you your house insured, I assume that they have to be insured, otherwise you can't own a house. So those are the kind of resources that your family may have. So let's say your house is not livable because the roof is gone and you got water. Then the insurance company will help pay for a hotel or some lodging for you in the meantime to stay there. So those are what we call response efficacy. Those things in combination with ideally communities Within the community, people help each other, neighbors help each other, you help your grandparents, relatives, friends help each other, that's called collective efficacy. So this study here is about doing a disaster, I think we bring the community members together to help each other. So for this particular study, the goal here is community action. So that is the, in the very last variable here, and apparently this is pretty much a very classic social psychology typology, and it does explain human behavior during a disaster. If you have any questions, just let me know. So, risk communication failures in the application of information technologies. Throughout, you grew up, you grew up and you're also growing up with a lot of new technologies including AI, right? Artificial intelligence. You don't think about AI very often, but AI is in your life every single day. The minute you ask Siri a question, who 
who do you think Siri is? It's the AI, right? Do we have um, some kind of Amazon, Alexa, or something like that? That's AI. AI is pretty much everywhere. We just don't think about it, right? Okay. So, technological uh, innovations and advances then help us think about, okay, we want to communicate very clearly and effectively during a disaster. What are the different ways that technology could help us? So, we already have established academic and research discipline called information science, right? And analytics and computer science and machine learning algorithms. You've probably heard of all of these before. So that's where the concept of disaster informatics comes in, okay? So disaster informatics would be the kind of information science techniques that we use to develop certain machine learning algorithms, and those algorithms could go into different kinds of technological devices, including even just web-based um, access. So you can access those resources, and they will spit out information that could be useful. So that's how I explain it. So the interesting thing about disaster informatics by nature, is really characterized by the integration of multidisciplinary research and technical practices, because we have wonderful computer science engineers, we have great information scientists, but they don't study human behavior per se. So that's where the integration comes in. Human um, social scientists like myself, Dr. Dr. Tan, we come together with some of these ex uh, technical experts to say, you know, if, if you program it this way, this is how people may respond. Or if you program it this way, this is how people may respond. And different people may respond to different things. So we need to have not so much a rainbow, we need to think about how to target and tailor certain messages, certain algorithms to reach certain kinds of people. That's also part of strategic communication. That as you target your audience, you tailor the message. Except in this case, we're using informatics, which is a little bit different than just your advertising slogan. Okay, so you can see this information technology here, health medicine, and so on. Social scientists here. This chart is a little bit old, 2020 study, but I tend to think that some of these things shifted a little bit. I think social scientists probably coming more heavily at this point, depending on what kind of informatics project we're talking about. All right. So this is so familiar to you. This is Texas, right? Okay. So integrating risk communication informatic tools. Um, you may not heard of the term GIS before, which is <coughs> geographic information systems, which uses pretty much just the informatics, right? We use remote sensing. Well, you all use Google Maps, right? Google Maps is GIS. Period. Okay. So they're constantly updating the data, hopefully, otherwise, um, I went to a meeting and my GIS went haywire, so I got lost. Um, so we, these days, we don't know how to drive anywhere anymore. We rely on our Google map, right? If Google map is not right, then you're lost. I experienced that firsthand last week. So if you look at this, um, this is an example using remote sensing technology and other data sources to map hazards assess damage, visualize routes to disaster areas or where you want to go to have a party, uh, and conduct spatial analysis. Spatial analysis meaning locations between spaces, right? And also, for example, uh, Houston is somewhere in here. Houston has a lot of what we call critical infrastructure units. So your electrical power are the critical infrastructure, your gas. So Houston, is the city in the United States that has the most pipelines underground. I don't know whether you know that because you produce a lot of oil. So I don't think it happens very often because they're very careful about it. Any time when you have a pipeline piece, you have environmental disasters. Same thing with natural gas, it's the same thing. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. But this is Texas. You can see that Texas coast Areas are vulnerable to 10 feet sea, sea level rise. It's pretty much up and down Texas coast, except for the part that's closer to, to the other states. Okay, but this area is very serious. So now there's another, another graphic. Texas coast, 
flat inundation and critical structure. Uh, can I go through that? So if you look at this, this is Florida, that's even worse. Okay. So all the green stuff, green dust, meaning, so this is flat inundation. Inundation meaning how far the water goes into, go inland. You can see that is Houston approximately, because I couldn't see. But that's College Station right there. And that's down up there. I'm just trying to get an idea of where everything is. So you are right here. Not that bad, and Houston is over here. You see all these areas. See, the very the redder that it is, the worse it gets, right? And the green dots would be um, shoot. What is the green dots? Green dots would be where flat can happen. Okay. So, these are the critical structures, and the green dots are the water. So you can see around Clinton area, there's a lot of critical structures. And so why do we call them critical structures? Critical structures supply the electricity, for example. It treats water. So your water has come from somewhere, right? And someone has to treat it so it's clean, so you could drink it. So think about all the things, things that you need to survive. That's what the critical structure um, units provide. And during the storm, if the critical structure is damaged, then your life is going to be really hard. All right, one more. This is Texas. That's what we call flush flat alley. These are the counties. If you look at that chart, there's a huge swipe across the state. What's flush flat? Flush flat would be when there's heavy rain. And your sewer, your water system, your, you know, around your house, you have, if you have public water, the sewage, right? And also water goes, going through some kind of, some kind of pipe and it takes it, usually go to the ocean or go to a treatment plant. So what happened is that when it's very heavy rain, your, your in, local infrastructure cannot really have enough runoff to take care of the rising, the heavy, rapid rain. So the water overflows. And not only that, when it's very heavy rain, you can't stop it. Your soil gets very, very soaked. Usually soil could absorb some of the water and goes into groundwater. It doesn't. It just cannot absorb it anymore. So the water just stays on top and then your house gets flooded. So flash flood is very dangerous because it's like almost without warning. Usually without warning, you just know it's heavy. Heavy rain coming, not a hurricane. You get it like weeks, a week ahead of time, three three days before they say evacuate. For flash flooding, it just came and then your street is wiped out. So it doesn't happen a lot. Up, uh, it's been happening a lot more often in New England. For example, in Connecticut, it was last month. There was a community you probably heard of it. The entire street just hollowed out, literally. The water just took it out and people's houses just kind of fell down. And they've never seen that before. Okay. So that would be flash flood. And you can see Texas under a lot of threat of flash flood. Okay. So then let's talk about integrating risk communication and informatic tools. I developed a mobile app. I call it a location based storm disaster mobile app. Um, Unfortunately, just before I came, I, I deactivate my apps because I'm adding new features to it. So I can't show it to you, but I'm showing you like two screens, okay? So that's my screen there, and it actually comes with an interactive map, um, GIS map. You click on it, you can see actually the whole country, but it's targeting primarily Connecticut. It will show you where the, where the flat pattern is, inundation area. And in my app, I also put in emergency care center, grocery store, gas stations, um, police station, fire stations, the kind of things that you need during a disaster, uh, also Red Cross. So that's in my app, you click on that map. So here's an example of what you see in the map, that's the inundation area. This is actually New Haven, you know where you, you heard of New Haven, right? That's where Yale University is located. So you can see that in this mouth here, and there's 
a lot of in the water goes all the way inland when it's a storm surge to affect this whole area, affect this whole area, and so on. So for this app, I call it Safer and Storm Assistance for Emergency Resilience. I actually have a website built just for this. It's a mobile app uh, right there, stormsafety.communication.ucom.edu. This mobile app aims to engage and motivate the public to adopt preparedness, be, preparedness behavior. So there are a million apps out there. Why do I build another one? Okay, I build another one because you probably have one or two weather apps, right? Doing a disaster, if a storm disaster is coming, what do you do? You probably have to go to different web pages to find out what's going on. I kind of integrated everything into one. So that's the difference. I also allow people, it's location based, allow people to actually assess their own risk at these different islands. I think I need to watch out for my time. So if you have any questions, just stop. So this is my usability study. Usability study means you test your software program or informatic tool to see how well it works. Again, I apply social, social behavioral psychology theory to study it. So you probably saw the same variables there, right? Preparedness versus efficacy, strong risk communication, and so on. Usually usability study, just study usability. I also study usefulness because the technology may be really useful, but not that useful. Is that possible? Okay. So I also study usefulness, and you can see these are very highly correlated. I have a question. Yeah. On, on that uh, graphic and then the, also the previous one, mm -hmm. uh, the perceived storm risk severity wasn't connected to self-efficacy. Yes, uh, that's right. So. I probably need to have a conversation with what you <laughs> online yeah. okay. okay to explain that. Um, I do have more, but let's talk after. Okay. Let's see. This is actually a, a sample selected by portrait. So it is representative. I put in criteria and all that. So risk communication feelings and application of information technology. In this case, think about the Communication failure between a patient, that would be you, and your care for that provider. That kind of communication errors, according to this, in, based on hospitalization statistics, could have reduced 671,440 preventable adverse events across to achieve this kind of saving. So I'm sure you went to the doctor before you felt like you're not connecting with the doctor. Did that happen? Well, the, the doctor is not connecting with you. How many of you had that experience? Okay, some of you probably didn't feel comfortable. I actually gave a seminar on risk communicate health communication at the UConn Medical School last week, talking about exactly this. Okay, so medical informatics. So the good thing is that again, thank you to computer science engineers and also informatics scientists, we now have medical informatics. In fact, most of the informatic products out there are medical informatics. You have nurses and researchers and uh, including insurance companies are all using it, okay? So I developed, co-developed a patient-centered medical information system that enables patients and providers to engage in shared medication management. And this system has been commercialized since 2000. Nine. So that's a while ago. So here I wouldn't spend too much time on this in terms of usability study. Uh, this is how a prototype was tested. We tested four times. But more importantly, remember how, what I mentioned about targeting the right people? This is for older people. So look at your grandparents. They take more than one medication, right? It's called polypharmacy. When you take more than one, medication and you're older, you sometimes get confused, sometimes you forget you take the wrong medication, and it costs billions of dollars to take older people who have medication error to the hospital, emergency rooms, and some of them die as a result. So this whole thing is to help them. So they have to pass these tests in order to be in our study sample for the usability study. 
So here's the usability study results, hence the statistics where you can probably just move on. So here's actually where the product is, okay, actual maps. You can see it's a provider, it's patient, and payer. So I can't tell you exactly which company uses it, but I could tell you some of the biggest insurance companies actually use the system, like United Healthcare or Cigna, some of those companies, and hospitals and clinics are also using the system. So what it does is the provider, we have provider version and patient version, but they are integrated. So we monitor patients, how they take medication, and we want them to report it. So if they report an error, and we honestly, we immediately try to help them reconcile the differences and help them. So this system, I think, does save lives, okay, and save emergency room visit. Uh, also, older people often have visiting nurses who come to their homes, so they also are part of the, part of the system to help the patients. All right, so, okay. So like I said, I try to pull different things together, risk communication, informatics, and environmental literacy, health, and equity. Okay, now I remember. Now, most people don't make the connection of how the environment that you live in affects your health. Do you, what do you think? Do you think most people think about that often? How many, of, how many people think, oh, you know, Wow, the air quality is not that good today. It affects my health. People don't think about that enough, right? Or my water quality is not the best. People don't think about that. So pretty much this, I want you to remember this. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil beneath us all affects our health, okay? So, so when it comes to environmental challenges, we have plenty. Why? Because we are a very industrialized society, isn't that true? If you go to Houston, you see all the smokestacks, don't you? All those things are not good for your health, for sure. So people who live in Houston, ideally they live upwind, not downwind area, so they don't breathe in those, that kind of air, right? So I don't know whether you have visited other places in the, even in the 1980s, early 1990s, if you visit California, if you land in California, you look towards the west, not the coastal area. If you're standing on the coastline, look toward the west, where the northern mountains areas are. You see smogs, literally brown air, like a rainbow that, that goes across the background. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That's how bad the air quality was in California. That's why California has the most stringent environmental loss in the country when it comes to states. Okay. So that the air quality is so much better now. So how do we connect these things together? What is environmental literacy? I think you know the word literacy, right? Environmental literacy, this is taken from someone else's definition, means, means the knowledge of environmental concepts and issues, the attitudinal dispositions. Now, let's not forget you can have the knowledge, but if your attitude is that I don't care, there's nothing we can do about it, right? So again, going back to so human psychology, motivation, cognitive ability and skills, appropriate behaviors to apply such knowledge in order to make effective decisions in a range of environmental contexts. So it's a combination of being aware, have enough knowledge, but have the attitude that say, this is serious and I'm motivated to do something about it. Then your environmental literacy is useful to you. Look on the other side. Environmental Protection Agency promotes sustainability. So what is sustainability? Sustainability does not mean we just wipe out all the petroleum plant, um, refinery plants in Texas. No, that's not what we're talking about. We want to make sure that they're sustainable from an environmental perspective, meaning we try to pass laws and policies that will help these industries make sure that whatever emission that they put in the air or whatever pollutants they might put in the water is reduced to acceptable standard. So it won't harm your health. That would be one example. When you do that, the system is sustainable from the pers pers perspective of preserving the earth that we live in. We only have one earth. Isn't that true, right? 
So if you don't protect it, you have no place to live that would be safe, right? So according to the Environmental Protection Agency, everything that we need for our survival and well-being depends either directly or indirectly on our natural environment and resources. To pursue sustainability is to create and maintain the condition under which human and nature can exist in productive harmony to support, support present and future generations. It's a very good definition, but it's difficult to achieve, right? Because we tend to think about, well, a capitalist society, we, company wants to make money. And that's why we have government, and it will be at us, right? And then we have how we vote also depend, depend, determines how more or less whether the industries are more powerful or, and, and can do whatever that they prefer to do. So if you think about the, the irony here is that if your environment is more sustainable, your economy will also be more productive and people will be healthier. So these three things actually go together. Environment, economy, equity. So what's equity? Equity means if you happen to live in a very nice area, you are less threatened by any of these environmental pollutions that I just talked about. Why? You have a better water system. Right? You have better air, but you happen to be low income or disadvantaged, you tend to live in areas where environmental pollution is heavier. Does that make sense to you? Right? So in this country, it's more of a local situation. I don't know what you heard of the term redlining, meaning we don't allow certain people to build houses in this area because it's kind of implied that this area is preserved for some people, but not everyone. So that means we create inequity between people and some people are basically living in quarters that are chronically in threatened by some of these environmental issues and challenges. Are you following this? You can think about around even in Texas, right? So it could be anyone who's low income, including people who live in Western Texas, West Northwest Texas, where it's mostly desert, right? So we people live in remote regions also suffer from this. So how do you connect environmental loans to the health? I think I gave you some examples already. So pollution, air, soil, water, I mentioned that. And not to mention in Texas, you have marine, right? Water, seawater. If you start seeing a lot of fish dying in your lakes, you know you're in trouble. Isn't that true? We all know that. If you see certain species dwindling or become extinct on your coast on your coastline, then you know you're in trouble, right? Because animals are a huge indicator of our environmental health as well. So smog, spoof, carcinogenic hazards, food chain disruption, contaminated water, plastic ocean. Have you heard of the concept of plastic ocean? Right? We have a lot of this, and people don't necessarily put it in the recycling bin. Usually this goes to landfill anyway, but when it's not in the landfill, it's litter in the street, that's the plastic solution. And what happens is that chances are it will go into a, a waterway and it'll go to the ocean. Okay? So that will be pollution right there. Climate change, warming temperature, sea level rise, flooding, erosion, severe storms, severe drought, frequent wildfires. As we speak, California has huge wildfires. California has always had wildfires, but in the past 10 years, there were more frequent wildfires and the fires are so much stronger and harder to contain. Why? Climate change. Some people have been denied as climate change, but you live it, even though you don't think about it. You already are living in the climate change environment. Okay. Public health, so they are connected to public health, rather than risk. You might not have heard the term zoonotic diseases. This is would be diseases that are transferred from animals to humans. So for example, COVID-19, right? We don't know exactly which animal yet, but have you heard of the swine flu? Okay, uh, that would be 2009, 2010. Okay, so H1N1 pandemic, right? Where did that come from? It came from a pig. So actually, originally, 
That virus was discovered about 10 years before H1N1 swine flu happened in the U.S. It was discovered on a Wisconsin farm. A boy who was 12 years old was handling the pigs on the farm and got the virus. And he didn't die or anything because H1N1 is a good thing. The lucky thing about H1N1, it was not very severe. <clears throat> Most people didn't die. But we still have, I think, a couple million people die around the world, maybe up to 5 million. I can't remember. I published some articles. Now I can't remember. But so that came from uh, a pig. That's why I call it swine flu. Now, HIV, you heard of that, right? Where did HIV come from? Monkeys. So these animals are carriers of the virus, but they don't get sick themselves. So the more we invade the wild areas, the more we push, the, the, the more we come into contact with wildlife, right? And the more of these kind of diseases could happen, jumping from the animals to humans. So that's do not a disease. Respiratory disease, sustainable food poisoning, hence, okay. So these pictures look really ugly, but they do exist, right? You don't see them necessarily, but they are in every part of our country. So your state, your local government really should think of it, take care of these. That water typically comes from the factory. And here, same thing, goes into the ocean. So these things are, all right. So I just mentioned a pandemic, right? And interestingly, I took, the, I have more of these pictures. What was interesting was that we start, we start doing, um, were you in school yet, college? Not yet. Okay, so the seniors would be the first two years of school, pretty much pandemic. So you took classes at home. And your, your younger siblings also took classes from home, right? They're homeschooled, kind of. So during that period, we, were, we didn't go to work. We did remote work. And what happened? Look at that. That's the East Coast, right? Look at the pollution. Okay, that's NASA image. It shows that a 30% reduction in atmospheric nitrogen dioxide compared to the same period last year. So that's 2019, that's 2020. Look at that. Connecticut is almost totally clear. Right there's Connecticut, I'm short. So this is Long Island right there, right? Okay, right about the Long Island is Connecticut. You see how, how much cleaner that is, right? And here's China, even more interesting. Um, that's Wuhan, Beijing is somewhere there. On this map, you can't even see Beijing. It's totally covered in smog. But because of redu reduction in driving, look at that, you can actually see China. Okay, significant decrease in air pollution over China. So those are the unknown benefits of the pandemic. Here's more, Italy. So Milan, Italy is a heavy industrial area. You can see how Milan changed so much on the top. Okay. And here's Los Angeles change, right? So, so I was hoping, I was really hoping, this is great. Maybe after the pandemic is over, employers, I don't know about here, but at UConn, for example, where I'm uh, stopped, are allowed to work two days from home. Are you, you have the same policy? Okay. So that reduces driving. I, I was hoping private industries would do the same. Not all of them. I was thinking if they do that, then we could be like this on this side. And it didn't happen. And Elon Musk requires his employee to report to work. Except I don't want to do seven days a week, at least five days a week. Okay. So they're still driving. But if we drive less, it's just such a simple behavior, isn't it? Right? Okay. All right. So I don't have a lot of time left um, here. What is it you can work? Telecommute, I just mentioned teleconference instead of meeting in person. Take the bus and train and bike and carpool. And always ask, do I need this product? Do you know Patagonia? Okay, so Patagonia had this campaign called don't buy this jacket. Have you heard that before? And guess what, they sold more jackets for them because they told people not to buy the jacket. So Patagonia had this, they're the, like the poster boy for environmental sustainability. Okay. 
Their jackets are expensive, but they ask you to buy a good jacket and wear it forever. But you got sick of it, give it to somebody else. So it's all about sustainability. And they are, like I said, the poster boy using sustainability to make tons and tons and tons of money, which means what? Companies can make money by being sustainable, right? Because that's their brand. Does that make sense to you? So durable by some by fewer, by local, by used. You probably don't know this. It's not taken off yet. So some companies would actually show you what the carbon content is for your to produce your food. That could be useful when it comes to environmental literacy, could it? I'm sure it can, right? So here's an example of that. And just think of your, I talk about work, what about at home? These are very simple concepts. Some of you have traveled to Asia and Europe before, some of you have. If you go into a hotel room, did you realize that you have to put your key into a slot in order to turn on the electricity? We don't do that in the US. It's so simple. It's just a sensor, right? So what is winter, summer, it doesn't matter. There's no light in the hotel room. You walk in. You put your key in the slot, the light comes on. When you leave, you have to bring your key with you, otherwise you can't get back into your room. So all the lights are out. Does that make sense? Right? Very simple. And installing sensors in this room, for example, when you leave, in five or 10 minutes, it turns the cell phone. If people forget to turn the lights on. So there are lots of things we can do. Food waste. You may not know this. About a third of the food that we produce will throw away. And guess what? To produce those food, we use tons and tons of fuels. It makes tons and tons of carbon dioxide into the air. So, so when you go to the grocery store, the fruits and vegetables are really good, right? Because they threw away the ones that don't look pretty. And it's just wasted. Isn't that true? Right? Okay. So imperfect foods, I encourage you. I, I don't buy food from imperfect foods. They got really smart. They bought the fruits that don't look pretty and sell it to you cheaply. And that's their brand, and they're very successful at it. Does that make sense? So they, they also now went into meat product as well. I don't have time to show the video. Oops. Oh, oops. I think I missed a slide. That's OK. So clothing. Apparel industry emits 25% of the wastewater in the world. Wastewater, meaning it's got chemical in it. So I wear a black dress. This is dye, right? That dye goes into the water, goes into the water system. Does that make sense? Even if you wear a white t-shirt, it's not white. They dye it white. So they release 25% of the wastewater. And 10 to 15 percent of carbon dioxide into the air. So that's what I'm, that's why the concept is called sustainable apparel, sustainable product life cycle. Okay. Um, you look at it's called circular commerce. Transportation, consumption, recycle, and so on. So here on the left, I just stopped that image. It's a little package that says something. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Like it's reduced price because. It's a little older and dated, but it's still edible. For example, don't throw it away. So here's the sustainable fashion. Some of the key concepts on the left. I published a few articles about it. All right. So I probably don't have time for a lot of slides, but I'm going to talk about this one. I don't necessarily love this graphic, but it kind of explains things a little bit. So what's the difference between quality, equity? And justice. So there's a term called environmental justice that is part of the canvas of social justice. So if you're low income, then you kind of chronically live in the area that has more environmental pollution. Is that justice? Is that equity? So what is, what's the difference? So if you look at this chart here, in any society, real justice is really hard to achieve. That includes legal justice because every country has a different legal system, right? And as you're aware, not all legal systems will always come out with the 
most fair and just decisions. Isn't that true? Remember O.J. Simpson? He might be too young to know that. He killed, he murdered his wife and he got away with it, right? Okay. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah, he wrote a book. If I did this or something, he actually made money out of, if I had murdered my wife, this is how I would have done it. And he made money out of it, believe it or not. So in most society, what we can do is to try to achieve equity, meaning giving people the tools or resources to reduce the adverse conditions that they live in. Okay, so anyway, I think we run out of time, so I'll take some questions instead. You can see I have a lot more slides here, but I want to show you one slide no matter what. That's our husky. Oh. <laughs> That's Jonathan. That's Paul in New England. That's Jonathan. But anyway, uh, questions? I think I might have raised a lot of questions in your head, but I might not have time to answer all your questions. It's only one hour. Yes. Yeah. 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 research studies. You mean as the academic? Like, yeah. Or environmental research. Environmental. Oh, oh. First, environmental research. Not in severe storms. That's the first one I said. Because the impact is so immediate, it's a little it's visual. And you see how Texas and Houston is flooded, right? So that was the first one. Oh, yes. yes. Very, very visible. Right? It's a disaster. It's not just like a long, long running series of things. It's a disaster. So that one. Anyone else? Yes. I also want to tell you that. I, yes, go ahead. Oh, just what made you interested in this topic to begin with? Oh, um, okay. My background is like a mixed bag. I actually worked in marketing before and I went to grad school. And I guess I felt that if I could use my academic skill, researcher skills, and maybe people skills, and actually took those skills into the community. Because I work in the real world before, I feel like I could make kind of somehow connect with people and help them with some of these issues. That would make me feel happy. And I think that's my motivation, if that answers your question. Okay. And then you said that you, did you say you had developed your own app as well? Yes. I so did. is that available to the public? Or, well, that one, uh, eventually I will let back to time to know when I bring it back again because I'm bringing the augmented reality game in the, in the app itself. So what's the biggest problem when, when you have a severe storm, power outage? You might survive the water and all that, right? Mm -hmm. Power outage. So I'm building a module there and it's going to be, I'm going to so. You're going to go through like a gauntlet in a way. Again, augmented reality. You probably don't know what augmented reality means. Augmented reality, unfortunately, we just run out of time. Um, uh, let me go back. Oh, did I get out? 